Hello, David here at merchantaccounts.ca. I'm gonna talk about credit card tokenization today. Tokenization sounds confusing. It's actually pretty simple. It's just the storage of credit card numbers, but it's not you storing it, or usually uh, for small and mid-sized businesses, you're not the one storing it. If you're tokenizing, it means that you're relying on a service provider to take your credit card numbers and store them for you so that you don't have to deal with the security headaches of storing sensitive information. So how does it work? Credit card tokenization is actually pretty simple. Tokenized credit card transactions start as a regular credit card transaction usually. Let's say that you have an online bookstore and you have a customer come to your website and they are going to add some stuff to your cart. And at this point, it's just a one-time order. I'm just going online as a customer and buying some books. Well, just go through the regular e-commerce transaction flow. The person adds the stuff to their cart, they hit the checkout button, type in their credit card number, hit submit, process, uh, it's done. And that's all there is to it. But with tokenization, tokenization starts when that's finished. Because when that order got processed, that one-time order, what happens is there's obviously an approval code or an approval message that you received. So then what your system can do is say, hey, service provider or payment processor usually, hey, payment processor, do you remember the authorization a second ago? The authorization number was XYZ123. I want you to go ahead and tokenize the card number associated with that order. Let's call it token 50. And anytime in the future, I'm gonna bill that card again I just say, hey, payment processor, bill token 50 for $200. And the whole point is, although you're not storing the card number, your credit card processor obviously knows what the card number is and they tokenized it for you. And now anytime you talk about, in my example here, token 50, the processor knows to charge the credit card associated with that token. It's the offloading of all the sensitive bits so you don't have to deal with it. Now, in my example that I just used there in the online bookstore, it started as a, it started as a regular e-commerce sale, a one-time sale. You can also do tokenization for the specific purpose of tokenization without hopefully getting you lost. Here's an example. Let's say Netflix, because I try and for some reason work a Netflix example into every post here. So you sign up for Netflix, but the first month is free. So they're not gonna actually charge your card at this point, but they still wanna collect it because if you stick with the service, Netflix is cool, so you probably will, um, what'll happen is they'll bill your card later on in the future. So the difference is this, when you send the payment to your tokenization service provider, you send what's a zero dollar transaction. It's actually called a verify request. So although no money is charged to the card, they the, your card issuer will receive the request and say, yeah, this card's cool, it's a real customer, this number matches, the expiry date matches. You know that it's a valid card. And at that point, the process is the same. Okay, service provider, you know the card I just gave you? Let's call that one token 51. So at any time in the future, and flushing out my Netflix example to its conclusion, the month goes by, I watch lots of movies, I'm keeping the service, Netflix wants to bill me now, it just says, hey, payment processor, Token 51, bill the card associated with it for $200 or, well, $20. Anyways, so that's the concept of you can either start as a regular e-commerce transaction and tokenize an order that was previously approved, or you can begin with a $0 verify request and tokenize from there. Two different approaches. They both accomplish the same thing. Why tokenize? Why deal with it? Security. Uh, I can't get around the topic of I have to talk about PCI compliance a little bit. So if you're a merchant and you sell things, it means there are security headaches that you have to deal with in the form of PCI, payment card industry, uh, the payment card industry data security standard. If your system touches or stores credit card numbers, it's quite a difficult um, questionnaire to complete. And I'm not gonna go off on a tangent here. Basically to become PCI compliant, you have to fill out a questionnaire. The questionnaire is difficult, uh, especially for someone who's not a technical expert or doesn't have a dedicated technical team. So if you're a smaller merchant or, a, or, you know, or even a large merchant, you just don't wanna deal with it, what do you do? Well, if you offload the sensitive bits onto a service provider, such as your credit card processor, uh, then you get to fill out an easier version of the self-assessment questionnaire, SAQA. 
uh, it, it's greatly shortened compared to the full version of the questionnaire. So the real benefit of tokenization is you're making your PCI compliance burden easier to deal with. Um, and you're also reducing your liability because I don't care how good of a hacker you are, if there's no credit card numbers to be stolen, there's nothing to get. So that's the big benefit of tokenization. So what type of business would benefit from tokenization? I already used the obvious example of Netflix or another obvious example, a web host, where you're gonna pay for your monthly hosting or a gym membership where they, you pay for your gym membership every month. These are really obvious, but what about businesses like a garbage company? If you own a garbage company and you have customer accounts and you have to bill them depending on how much uh, tonnage, I guess, in garbage or, or waste disposal you did each month, you're gonna to have to call that customer and hunt them down every month. Why not tokenize the data and bill their card on file or, or their tokenized card on file? Another example could be a property management business. If you take rent payments and you don't wanna to have to chase down your, uh, your tenant every month, bill the rent on credit card. And if, you have, if you've tokenized the data, you've stored the card and you don't have to worry about any of the security headaches. If you have a business to business type of service, for example, if you're an accountant, a bookkeeper, a lawyer, oh gosh, I mean, you could be a, 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 a landscaper, a lawn maintenance company, it doesn't really matter. Anytime you have client accounts or customer accounts, you can send them off the invoice and then just bill the card stored on file every month. So tokenization isn't just for businesses that do automatic recurring billing. It's uh, it can be used by lots of businesses. And then the last obvious example is if you have an e-commerce website and you, it's a type of service where people come back and repurchase from you frequently, don't make them re uh, create their or re-enter their credit card credentials all the time. You can create a customer account and then when they return to your website, um, you know, like Amazon, when I go back on Amazon, if I complete a purchase, I'm not re-entering my credit card every time. It's not just for Amazon, even small businesses can do the same approach and it's very easy to implement with tokenization. You probably didn't know that you can lower your processing costs with tokenization. Although I need to clarify that, it's not even just tokenization. You can lower your, bill, your, your credit card processing costs because there is a lower interchange rate. Visa and MasterCard offer a lower interchange rate for recurring billing transactions. Most merchants have no idea about this. You should know about this. And if, you're, if your business does recurring payments and you're not taking advantage of this, you're literally just throwing away money. So when you're looking at doing tokenization, you wanna to talk to your credit card processor or your service provider and make sure that the flag, the recurring billing flag, is being properly passed in the transaction so that you get the lower interchange rate. And I probably said like three confusing things in that sentence. So first of all, interchange, is the true cost that you incur or that processors incur uh, when a credit card transaction is processed. So the cost from Visa and MasterCard goes down when it's a recurring billing transaction. Secondly, I mentioned a flag. A flag without getting too technical, it's a programming term. Whenever a transaction submitted to, to your processor and on to Visa and MasterCard, they need to know somehow if it's a recurring billing transaction in order to lower the interchange rate. So you wanna make sure the recurring billing flag is being passed with the transaction, which takes me to the topic of your credit card processor or your third party tokenization service provider. You want to make sure, and you can ask this question, if I'm using your service to handle my, my to tokenize my data and to do recurring billing, Am I going to qualify for the lower interchange rate? Or is a special flag being passed to Visa and MasterCard to make sure that I get that lower rate? And then, because I just rant on at, at length, when you uh, are getting set up for your merchant account originally, you have to be on interchange plus pricing. Because even if you make sure that your, your platform supports the flag, even if you make sure that it's being passed properly, if you're not on interchange plus pricing, the cost will go down, the processor will enjoy it, it just won't be, the savings won't be passed on to you as the merchant, and you deserve the savings. So I do have uh, other talks about interchange and lots of content on that. Get on interchange plus pricing, it's the best pricing model there is, especially for mid-sized and larger businesses. 
Now I've talked a few times about credit card processors and sometimes I've used the term interchangeably. I've said service providers. Well, the reason that I've been doing that is there are companies specifically out there that do credit card tokenization and other services as well. So one of the really popular ones that I like is called Spreedly. Spreedly Spreedly has been around for a bunch of years. It started its life as a tokenization vault. Uh, but it does a lot more than just that. Uh, so, okay, so the difference is this. If you're using a credit card processor and you're using the credit card processor's tokenization, uh, it means your, your website is just gonna talk straight to your credit card processor. But if you're using Spreedly, they sit in the middle. Your website's here, they go, hey, Spreedly, I have an order. It goes to Spreedly, and then Spreedly takes that order and forwards it onto the payment processor. And there's some advantages to this which are a little bit outside of the scope of this discussion, but I'll include them for reference. So because Spreedly is in the middle, it means, for example, if your payment processor had an outage or a downtime, Spreedly can take that transaction that was supposed to go here and route it to your backup processor as an option. Or let's say that you submit a transaction, Spreedly sends it on, it gets declined by your payment processor, Spreedly can see that decline and reroute that same transaction somewhere else to try for an approval. Although it's counterintuitive why that would work, sometimes card issuers decline the transaction um, over at a certain processor and approve it at another one. As an example, because you might be routing it to your Canadian payment processor and it's a time of day thing with the card issuer, uh, I'm getting very te technical here, but card issuing banks have anti-fraud algorithms that can be very com complex and are very proprietary and are very um, confidential. So you can only uh, try and extrapolate what they might be looking at to determine if a transaction is legitimate or not. But if you have a transaction that is legitimate, sometimes they still get declined. It could be perhaps because this customer is doing a purchase at a certain time of day that's not in their in their buying profile. I realize it's a little bit of a stretch, but if you then routed that transaction to a European payment processor and it's business hours and the and your issuer sees, oh, this transaction's coming from Europe, maybe they're on vacation, uh, maybe would have a slighter chance of, of giving the approval. I'm way off on a tangent now. That was a really kind of off the wall example, but the point is you don't know. Right, it's, it's not always possible to know. So having that middle link back on the topic of Spreedly in the middle can do more cool stuff than just tokenization, but that's what it does at its core is it tokenizes your data and it makes it portable. So one of the other benefits is if you do use a tokenization service provider, and I actually have to address this point, when you tokenize your data with your credit card processor, they've got it and they've got you. So you wanna make sure that your credit card processor will release that tokenized data back to you if you ever wanna to migrate to a different payment processor. So you should talk to them before you set up, you should get it in writing, in an email, or in your processing contract, because the downside of tokenizing your data is you don't have it. And if you need it someday and you can't get it, well, that's a big problem. Now with Spreedly in mind, that the reason Spreedly makes it easier to port to a different payment processor is because if you are going to change to a different payment processor, your tokenized data is sitting outside of your processor's environment. It's all here. So all you have to do is say, hey, Spreedly, don't talk to these. You're done with them. Talk to these guys from now on. It's, there's not even a blip. It's business as normal. And even outside of just tokenization, Spreedly makes portability to different payment processors easy for that reason, because they're integrated already with so many different payment processors. Uh, it makes it really easy to move to new, get in, to get merchant accounts with new payment processors. This is enough of my commercial for Spreedly. Spreedly, you're welcome, but it is a cool service. I think it's time for a summary here. Although tokenization sounds complicated, it's really simple. It all happens after a regular transaction is being processed. It's just after you have that initial approval or that initial authorization re request, instead of sending that credit card number off to be processed, you're just saying, hey, payment processor, token 50, hit that up for 200 bucks. You've gotten the cards out of your system. If you do use in-house credit card processing with your payment processor, which is really good too, there's nothing wrong with that at all. A quick note, some payment processors will include that for free. So if you can get it for free, get it for free. It should be a, a topic of discussion when you're searching for your payment processor at merchantaccounts.ca. We do offer it for free uh, with most of the gateway platforms that we, that we put our clients on. 
Uh, and if a, a consideration is if you do small tickets, uh, like sales under $10 on average, the costs of tokenization become a lot more important. If you're doing airfare or um, you know, you're building patios or it's like a $10,000 ticket, an extra couple cents a transaction isn't gonna make any difference. But for small merch, for small tickets, it really does. And you should work that into your uh, research when you're choosing your platform. Finally, you're giving up control of your data. Make sure you get a commitment that you can get it back someday if you ever want it. And I think that's it. That's the topic of credit card tokenization. I hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at merchantaccounts.ca. Thanks.